Epic, another podcast episode from With Purpose. My name is Chris, and I am the owner as well as lead business strategist for the company. Our special guest today is Dan Alcorn, CEO of Daniel Alcorn Consulting. Dan, how are you, sir? Doing great. How about you? I am doing well. Thank you for asking. I am, I've known you for just a short amount of time, but um, I, your energy, just I had to get you on. I Thank really you. did. Um, and your, for your wealth of your wealth of information that you have about what your our topic is going to be today is uh, is that same caliber. So I look forward to having you. Yeah, thanks so much for having me on. So not a problem. So Dan, tell us a little bit about yourself on a personal level. Yeah, so a little about myself. Um, I'm born and raised. I'm a San Diego boy. Um, spent half my life in San Diego, two years in Albuquerque, and then the other half in Northern California, and uh, two to three years in Los Angeles. Um, and then ran back to San Diego once I was done there. <laughs> so, um, so that's kind of uh, more on a travel side, but yeah, I'm, I'm in Northern California or in Southern California in Carlsbad. Um, I, with, uh, COVID and everything going on, I've got two puppies to keep me busy. I've got a 13 month old, uh, Italian master who's 110 pounds. And I have a five month old boxer who's 30 pounds and they play nonstop. So that is my entertainment being locked inside right now. Those have got to be good wrestling buddies, too. They, they are. It's kind of David and Goliath, but it's uh, pretty surprising, the box, the noises she makes and how she attacks, and then he just kind of lays on his back and just lets her do her thing, and they're, they're best buds. So it's, it's, uh, it's, it's, a, it's a good mix. All right. Very good. So um, what would I typically ask this question of everybody that is uh, on the show. Um, what would you clean first, your room, your desk, or your car? It's a good one. Normally, it's my car. Um, I just, I like having a clean car or my truck. Um, but so I just bought this house. It's in a new development. Construction is still going on. It's only half of it's, you know, half of it's built, the other half. Um, they're working on. So there's dust like crazy with them doing construction. So I have accepted the fact that my truck is not going to be clean for like another six months. <laughs> so I have scratched that and just said, I'm going to keep my office clean and organized and try to keep the house clean with two puppies running around. Um, so lately it has been my office because that's where I am, you know, spending most of my time if it's not, you know, with, with the dogs. Um, but normally I like having a very clean vehicle. It just makes me feel relaxed, like hop in the car and go for a ride. Um, or my motorcycle, have it nice and clean dial in right along the coast. But um, I've, I've kind of had to accept the fact that it's going to be dirty for like a, probably till the end of the year. So wow. it right. is what it is. That's true. Yeah. So do you have like a favorite word or catchphrase that you use? And if so, why? I do. Um, the appropriate one I would use is suck it up buttercup. Okay. So it, coming from a very strong sales background, I started off in the mortgage industry. It started my sales in the mortgage industry where it was basically boiler room in the mortgage industry. I and mean, that's basically how I started my career. And so the most appropriate way to say it would be suck it up buttercup. So when I you know, before I branch off and work for myself, which I do now, um, you know, as a manager and as an executive working with the sales reps and have been in their shoes and been in the trenches and, and done their job and basically, you know, work my way up the corporate ladder, um, everyone kind of knows, like, you know, if you're going to complain, Dan's going to say, suck it up, buttercup, and get back to work. You know, there's no reason to complain. Complaining doesn't, you know, give you the answer if you want. Find a solution to it. So uh, in the corporate world, it's always been suck it up, buttercup. <laughs> I like it. I like it a lot. Um, so tell us, you, you kind of started to allude to it. Tell us a little bit about your business, um, how you got into it and, and why you stay in it. Good question. So I said, I, I spent 20 years in the corporate world, you know, doing the corporate grind, you know, people say nine to five, really it's 6 AM to 7, 8 PM, five days a week and sometimes some stuff over the weekends. And, even though I loved it, I loved the companies that I worked with, I was able to learn a lot in the career. And it wasn't just the, you know, a large number of different industries, you know, from finance, mortgage, IT, real estate, leads. I mean, I got to work a, a, a large array of different industries and different types of people and different sizes of companies. Um, I think I got to the point where there wasn't a work-life balance. Mm. You know, I think, you know, accomplishing of buying a brand new home, you know, working so hard to get in certain type of materialistic things, I'd already had, you know, after 20 years, I could basically buy what I wanted, but that only goes so far. It's like the warm and fuzzies of buying a brand new car. It's good for a few months. And then you're like, eh, you know, the new car smell goes away. Um, so I kind of did some, you know, some good soul searching. It's like, what makes me happy? And for me, 
is traveling. I love traveling, um, hopping on the motorcycle, going in on weekend trips or two, three, four week trips and going away. And I can't do that working for somebody else. So I made the, the transition last year after the last company I'd worked with, a you know, great company. And I kind of decided after I did some interviews with some companies and there was great bonuses and great packages and everything sounded really good on paper. But then I was like, I'm going to go back to the same type of work grind. and It's not worth it for me. You know, that work-life balance is not there. So I didn't want to give up working with companies and helping them grow and working with the sales teams and doing the one-on-one -on -one coaching and the trainings and everything that goes along with it. I just positioned myself now being able to work as a consultant for them as say for six months or for a year to help them do the same type of roles that person would do as a full-time employee. A lot of times you don't need a full-time vice president of sales. If you're going to pay a minimum of 200 grand a year. Sometimes you don't need it. You could have someone come in and help you out for six months or a year and give you the same expertise. Mm -hmm. And that's for me is where I still get the joy and the fun of being able to help companies grow, but I'm not stuck to just one company. You know, I can work with 10 companies and then I can learn from them as well. They learn from me and it doesn't kind of put me in a box of just like, you know, say, hey, want to grab, you know, some friends and go away for a trip for a few weeks. I don't have to put in the request and wait for someone to approve it. You know, I can, I can do it on my own. So I think for me, the biggest thing is the work-life balance and still being able to do and work with companies and help them grow and not just be stuck to just one company at a time. Okay. So thank you very much for explaining that. Dan, when, when you're talking about going into companies and helping them grow, um, what type of companies do you work with? Most of the companies I work with are going to be small to medium-sized companies, um, basically with an emphasis on revenue growth, where they have an existing sales team, or they're trying to build out a sales team. So most of my companies um, either are in an aggressive growth phase, or they're maybe a, a smaller size company with some uh, venture capital, some investment coming into the company, and they're a smaller size, say 10 or 15 employees. They've got one or two sales reps. They've got an influx of cash. They'll need to grow. Now what do we do? And typically, the first thing they do is they go hire a vice president of sales or a sales manager. I think that's the last thing they should do. They actually don't have the foundation ready for it yet. Um, they actually need to work with someone like myself who's already gone through those growth phases and say, you need to do X, Y, and Z first, right? How are you managing your leads? What's your CRM? How are you managing your emails? Do you have email tracking? There's a lot of things that goes into it before you start hiring a bunch of people because it'll work well for a short period of time. And it's kind of like building a building and not having a solid foundation. You'll hire someone and you'll see a spike of sales, but you don't have all the other stuff built out. You don't have a way to track it. And kind of your, your growth peaks very fast. And they try to understand why. And they end up maybe bringing on a new salesperson or a new sales manager. And that doesn't fix the problem. They don't understand why because they didn't fix you know, the foundation from the very beginning. Um, and that's typically the companies I work with. Um, or companies which don't have a sales team, you know, don't have a sales team that built out, or they have an existing sales team and they really want to maximize their numbers. And I come in there and help that sales team overcome you know, any objections they're having with their customers. We do role playing one on one with Zoom, like we're using right now. Um, you know, basically things like that. You know, it, it's really. I wish I had met you a year ago. And I'm just going <laughs> to throw this out there, and maybe just real quick between our dialogue. Sure. Um, my company was growing, growing. We were getting lots of clients. And the very first thing I did was bring someone on for sales and marketing, which you just said, that's the, that's the last thing I should have done. Yeah. So, um, so if I hear you correctly, so first of all, I've learned from my mistake, but then the next thing is, is, is to find you or someone like you um, that can help build upon that foundation that's already been laid. Correct. Yeah. I mean, typically when I go in, I have a checklist for onboarding with any new customers to see where they are in their business, where they want to be, and understanding what the vision of the company is, you know, from the owner, CEO, um, and also the, the sales team or the sales team they're trying to build, what does that look like to them? Because what it may look like to the CEO, and maybe say they already have a sales manager, could be apples and oranges. You know, you got to make sure everyone's on the, everyone's on the same page. Um, so that's typically what I'll do is we basically will start from the beginning of where are you at, where do you want to be? Where do you see your say top five problems you want to tackle this year? And then I'm going to, I'm going to ask certain questions. I'm going to come up with what I think you should be focusing on your top five. And then I'll explain why. And then we'll work together to get the results you need. And if what they think their five 
items are they need to work on is different than mine, then I'll kind of explain to them why. Not that we wouldn't work on those items, but they maybe will work on two of them because those are a priority. The other three really seem like a priority, but they're really not because they're not going to affect anything for probably, say, six months or a year. They're really not going to affect your business, right? Okay. It's, it seems like a priority, but it's really not. Do you, um, help them, do you help them understand that it's a priority or not a priority? I do, yeah. And I'll explain why. I, I'll give basically examples um, of, of things that are priority. So to give an existence, a client of mine recently wanted to start doing paid advertising, PPC, pay-per-click advertising, Google AdWords. Last thing they should be doing. <laughs> they didn't have any way of tracking their, their sales uh, with, with a, a strong CRM. You know, it could be Salesforce, Zoho, um, CRM, Sugar CRM, any of them. You know, they didn't even have, they were using Excel. So they want to start doing paid advertising, but they don't have any proper way to properly track it and track these conversions and do A-B testing to see which ones worked, which ones didn't work. So they'd already dabbled into it a little bit and they were spending a couple thousand bucks a month and they weren't converting them because they weren't properly tracking them. And also their sales teams were missing the leads. So they were just, that foundation there wasn't initially set up. I'm like, that's good, but we'll probably push that for like six months to nine months out in the back burner. Let's work on some other thing. Let's do some organic marketing we can do free. And then we'll dive into the paid side of the business when you're ready for it. You know, and that automatically, you know, they're saving two to $3,000 a month because they're not spending the money on those leads because they weren't converting them anyways because they weren't properly tracking them. So these are things that I've worked with the company on. And, um, you know, the, the email tracking and the tracking the customers, what's their process when they get a customer, to closing them, how are they closing them, you know, are they doing a phone call, emails, you know, how are they heading their, handling their leads? You know, I've worked with some companies in the past that they would send leads to their, to their sales reps and their reps would never pick up the phone and actually call the customer. They would just shoot off an email. You know, it's like a shotgun blast. Just shoot it out there and see what sticks. You're losing a lot of leads and the ones that fall to the ground, there's still an opportunity there. So what do you do with those? Well, you put them into a uh, you know, marketing drip campaign for templates which are already you know, created, and now it goes into a campaign which is already built out. And that way, you're still engaging with those customers, and they can go, once they engage, they can go right back to the salesperson. Gotcha. So do you work with all different types of CRMs or only a few? I've worked with probably like the top 10. I mean, there's, there's so many CRMs out there, but I mean, I, I'm a Salesforce admin certified. I've been for years. So I know Salesforce inside and out. Um, if you're a small to medium sized company, you don't need something as robust as Salesforce because it's really meant for everything for the business, you know, sales, marketing, finance, accounting, you know, their CPA, CPA can have access to it. I mean, it's, it's such a robust system and, it, and it's the most expensive. You know, you don't need to spend that kind of money. You can get away with it using Zoho or Sugar CRM or Infusionsoft. I mean, there's so many of them out there for less than half the price or a quarter of the price that work just as well and give you the needs of a company and for the sales reps, what the price of the really large ones are. You know, gotcha. it really depends if you need all of those integrations. You know, if you're doing large auto dialers, um, you know, for an outbound sales team, you know, then you need to make sure that, you know, it has an integration with say Infusionsoft, which is one of them that uh, like say for five, nine, it's an auto dialer you use for your sales team. I've used it for numerous companies and it's great, but it doesn't, it doesn't integrate with some of the smaller, cheaper CRMs, but it will work for Salesforce and, and Infusionsoft. Um, okay. It really depends on what the needs are, but I've, I've worked with most of them in my career. And in the ones that I haven't worked with, um, they're all very similar. You know, a lot of the companies that are out there I haven't used are particularly white label from another company. So it's the same software, just a different name. Someone else is selling it under a different name. Okay. So real quick, how long have you, um run your own particular business? So beginning of last year is when I launched my consulting firm. Okay. I've, it's not the first time I've worked myself. I've actually had my own hard money lending company uh, when I lived up in the Bay Area. And I had that for three years for my, with my partner. And we successfully sold it to a large private lender within three years. Oh, wow. So we started out from scratch. So I, I know the grassroots of starting a company from nowhere and building everything working from home to you know building it to a 40 50 60 person sales team and selling that company off um i've done it and i've made all the mistakes of what business owners have done i've, I've spent a hundred thousand dollars in marketing they went nowhere and you have to learn from it and fix it and then you end up making four times that once you fix it 
So I've made a lot of the mistakes that most people are going to make. <laughs> so I hope people are really tuning in right now because I know I am. There's been, I, I, I couldn't tell you how much countless dollars I've spent on marketing and sales as well and you add up everybody that has been trying to do this and that and kind of like the shotgun approach as you mentioned, all the tens of thousands of dollars probably into the millions or more that have been spent on this. So what are some things as you've learned and you've got that grassroots perspective as well? Dan, tell us some, just a couple, three things that you've learned from um, being a business owner. The first thing I would say is there's always gonna be more work to be done. Don't stress about it. Cut off the time at five o'clock or four o'clock and go spend time with your family. You know, that for me is, is big and I didn't do that um, and that's the reason I work for myself because now I actually have a work-life balance and if I want to do a three or four day weekend trip, I can go do it. Um, for me, that's one is really turning the work off because you could stay and I've done this in my career because I wanted to advance my career. I want to look better to my boss, you know, the owner of the company or CEO and I you know, wanted to get the extra, little extra money for my bonuses. But the amount of time that I lost of not actually de-stressing, going to the gym, or relaxing and you know putting some music on and having a glass of wine or go seeing some friends or you know, going on a hike with the dogs like to me that's like the number one and I don't know it's it's very simple to say it but it's very tough to do like you almost have to for me I had to set an alarm on my phone that said turn your computer off and that was it and I had an alarm set for five o'clock and it would go off and I would have three of them after it because I knew I'd always hit the snooze button just like in the morning when you wake up you don't want to do it the way to fix that is set your phone across the room the furthest part away from your room that has a plug if you're going to charge it so the alarm makes you get out of bed so for me uh, i think that that's the other part is having a great schedule in place you know my alarm four o'clock in the morning four thirty. get up walk the dogs hit the gym start work go until four or five my alarm set five o'clock power the computer down go spend time, go do something else. Um, you know, I think for me, that's one thing that I've really learned as a business owner and as just throughout my career that you kind of have to take the time for yourself because time is one thing you can never get back. You can lose money, you can make a lot of money. You know, market the market's down, but it went up 900 points today. It's gonna go up and down. You can't do that with your time, unfortunately. And for me, I think, you know, it took me 20 years to realize that. Of, of working in the corporate world of, you know, being big into fitness and then you kind of dive into the, the trenches and start working and you're in a new company and all of a sudden you put on 40 pounds in a year and you don't know why. Because well, you just neglected all the stuff that actually really was important, you know. So I think for me, that's one thing that I've learned as a business owner of just having a schedule, putting time for yourself, turning it off. Um, and, and if you have trouble doing it, I mean, I always, I'll get stuck in something and I'll be like, I need some motivation this week, right? I'm just Monday morning, not feeling it. YouTube, motivation. And I'll just bring up something and just put it on for five minutes and kind of get your head in the game and then go back at it. Like I, I try to find myself as like, if I'm getting procrastinated, I have to, why am I getting procrastinated? Like, why am I avoiding the most important things? You know, my business, like MIT's most important tasks. These are things that I teach in my coaching is for the sales reps and the managers and the owners, what's your MIT? What's the most important thing you have to do in your business today? Write it out, tackle those first three things. The rest of them probably doesn't matter if you do them today or Thursday or Friday, right? You know, so these are kind of things I've had to learn the hard way. Um, and it's kind of things I've tried to embrace and I still have to check myself every now and then. That's great wisdom. Thank you very much, Dan, for sharing that. So um, I know that we're always in a perpetual cycle of selling ourselves, right? Um, we always are representing, we always want to give. It kind of goes to what you were just sharing about, you know, being healthy and, and over the course of time kind of adding on the pounds or even for some going the opposite way, uh, losing all this weight. What, what advice would you have for us um, maybe just one piece in helping us grow so that we are, we're, um, we're conscious, if you will, of, of what we're selling and, and how we're presenting ourselves as well as our business. Yeah, I mean, I think for me, it's kind of taken learning from my mistakes okay. in the career, you know, for me. It's really kind of like I said, I've 
I had it where I was doing triathlons and I was lean, had an eight pack and I was ripped. And I worked for a company and in a year I put on like almost 50 pounds because all I did was work, you know? And it was like, you go, how did that happen? Well, you just focused on one thing, which was not a priority. You know, career is important, but I think there's a lot of things for me of kind of selling yourself is making sure, you know, you take care of yourself and, and your, your health and your fitness, your, um, you know, me mentally, your, your sound and spiritually, no matter what the religion is. Um, just having a clear mind and being able to like go into work with a clear head and being able to, you know, kind of have like a, like a faith kind of behind it. And it doesn't have to be any religion. It could just be, you know, whatever it is, Christian, anything, really, Buddhism, it could be anything. Um, for me, I've kind of noticed that that's kind of helped me be more centered and be able to have like a community that I work with that kind of checks me when I start getting out of line. It's like having your wife, you know, a girlfriend, you're kind of getting out of line, you know, they kind of give you a little nudge. Um, I've had the pleasure of working with people that were my boss throughout my career who have been that person who nudged me, who was like, you're getting off track. You're, you're not focusing on what's important for, you know, for you or for the business. Right. And for me in my career, I purposely not stayed in one industry for too long because I felt that I'd be stuck and I'd only would learn that particular technology or that expertise. You know, so I did mortgages, I did finance and I sold, you know, then we did real estate leads and I had my own, finance company we sold it um domain industry and i purposely didn't stay in one space because i felt that i'd be refining myself to a particular box that people would say dan alcorn is only going to be good at mortgages he's only going to be good at finance he's only going to be good at real estate right and i think in your career i think it's good to do that to expose yourself to different industries so you don't get put in that box because i've worked with people and, and i've hired sales reps who have come from a particular industry <coughs> They don't do well because they're they've only been trained and coached a certain way. Now, if they're coachable and they're a sponge, that's a different story. Um, but for me, I've purposely done that. You know, I'm always looking for ways of challenging myself and challenging the team that I work with. And a lot of times, that's going to be you know coaching seminars. You're not necessarily working with me. Go to a Tony Robbins. He's high impactful. You're going to get in your face. You're going to feel uncomfortable. And I think when it comes to any sort of training you do. Not even just to say it with myself, because I push people out of their comfort zone. I, I'm, I'm going to be your type A personality, no nonsense. I'm pushing out of your comfort zone because I know what somebody can do. And I like to put myself in those situations when it comes to kind of selling myself and, you know, pursuing, you know, being better in my career is finding what I'm not good at and finding someone who's an expert at it and learning from them. And if that's a Tony Robbins seminar or some other seminar, um, I think that's a good way to go to challenge yourself and always have a new perspective or, or maybe a new company, maybe you hit a company and there's no upward mobility, go work for a company that's growing and, and, and go after it because you're going to learn something new and they'll learn from you. You'll learn from them. And now you just, now you added that onto your resume. You know, I think that's the best advice that I could have for, um, you know, even sales reps or even just the CEOs themselves. I mean, some of the best CEOs I've worked for have not stayed at a company longer than three years. Wow. You know, the average tenure for a sales rep is 12 to 15 months. That's just, that's, that's standard. Trying to find a sales rep to stick around or an executive of sales, a sales manager, VP of sales. You'll never see someone nowadays there longer than three years unless they're heavily vested with the company because they hit a limit and they're not making either not enough money, they're not recognizing the company, or there's no upward mobility. And then they go to a company that's growing and saying, hey, we're, here's position, here's 5% equity. And now they're learning a new industry, a new, you know, a new trait, and they're really pushing themselves. And I think for me, I, I purposely push people I work with to like get to that level. And if I'm working, you know, when I was running companies, I've had people that we didn't have any upward mobility. That was the role at that time. So I'll give you a great recommendation. I'll sell you whoever you're trying to work with and I'll make sure you get that job. I want to see you succeed in your career. Yeah. It sucks to lose the person, but I'm not going to hold someone back for my personal gain or, you know, the company's gain. You know, it, it's not fair to people. You really have to challenge yourself out of your, your comfort zone. Right. So, so Dan, why you, what separates you and your business from other businesses in your industry? Good question. I mean, I, I touched on it, you know, a little bit. I think there's a lot of people out there that are consultants that have absolutely no real world experience. And that's the reason that I felt that I would be successful at it. And I wanted to do it because I've spent 20 years doing it in the grind. I mean, in the trenches is what I refer to. I've been in the trenches. I started off as 
a loan officer at 18 knowing nothing about loans. I didn't know points, I didn't know loan to value, debt income ratio, all these finance terms that I know very well now, I didn't know anything about. It. And I just went in there, worked hard, shut up, became a sponge and just worked and grind as hard as I could until I was 21, I was their youngest corporate trainer. I traveled around the US and opened up hundreds of offices for them all throughout the US and trained thousands of loan officers at like 21, 22, 23 years old as I was there. And then I hit my limit and I realized I couldn't go any further with the company. And so I found another company was growing and I moved on. So the reason I'm different is I've, I've been in those shoes. I've been in the executive level shoes all the way down to the entry level position. And I know what those roles are, the struggles they go through, what it takes to be in that role and to build it out and what's successful. You know, everything from the sales scripts, all the way up to vice president of sales and chief sales officer, and as well as also owning your own sales company. You know, I had my hard money lending company. I had to manage 40 to 60 sales reps and plus manage all the other parts of the business. So when I work with CEOs, I know that that's one piece of the business. There's a lot of other pieces of the business that their head has to, you know, their brain has to concentrate on, not alone, just that one side, you know, just that one part of the business. Um, so I'd say for me, you know, different is I've actually, I've been in the shoes that people that I'm coaching with, they, I've already been there, I've done it. And I've, and I've, made, and I've made all the mistakes, you know, um, and it's mistakes sometimes cost a lot of money. That's how you learn. If you do something hard, let's say like, you know, marketing, I've had it, well, we had a company, we spent a hundred grand and marketing and it flopped mm. we fixed it we made 500 grand within three months because we fixed the marketing it was wrong then we fixed it we had it to a new industry a new niche for the hard money lending the niche we were going after was not what we thought it was going to be we switched it three four months later large amount of revenue increased so you have to be willing to make mistakes and just learn from them you know if you make the mistakes over and over again you know you're not, you're not gonna get anywhere so i said the biggest thing is i've 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 been there i've done it and i've made the mistakes um, and I really enjoy working with people to help them, you know, grow their companies and work with me. I love working with the sales team one-on-one, -on -one, not just the CEO, but really working with the sales teams, doing the one-on-one -on -one coaching tra trainings, you know, through the video like we're doing and also doing the video shadowing calls. That's one thing for me I really push is your sales team, we're, I'm going to shadow them virtually on their calls. We're going to see what they're doing, how they're calls doing. We're going to record them when I'm not there because sometimes when someone's kind of watching, you get a little nervous, you mess up then you can record the calls without somebody there and I can kind of, you know, watch it and give some, you know, critiques, et cetera. Um, so for me, I'm more of a hands-on type person. Um, and I'm, you know, I say also kind of touch base earlier, kind of like no nonsense. I'm very a straight shooter and I like to work with companies that are in a spot where they're tough and they want to get to where they want to be or they're growing and they're doing really well. Now they got an investment. Now they want to build things out. I love working with those companies too because you know they've they've got the motivation of they're growing they got cash someone is invested in them let's grow it you know they're really excited. Okay, so Dan, what is just one thing, one thing in like thirty seconds that you can share with us that people seem to misunderstand about the sales industry? Oh, I mean, it's kind of like saying like car sales. You kind of get or like saying attorney. You know, people kind of cringe a little bit, right? Um, <laughs> I mean. If you're referring to, you know, the sales side, um, you know, for industry per se, you know, I think you typically say like you're a salesperson, people think like you're only out for the money, right? That's it. And in reality, the people that I've worked with that have been the most successful, they wanted to make a lot of money. That was their motivator and that's okay. But you have to make sure the customer is taken care of first, right? Because as soon as you screw the customer, you got your bad reviews and everything else starts going downhill from there, right? So I like to work with people that are motivated and that, you know, sales is making money. I mean, that's it. <laughs> it's simple as that. Sales equals money. You know, and, that, that's, and I'll go over that in the coaching, but it's also what is your customer's feedback? What's your customer retention? You know, what are your reviews? Uh, what's your reputation management look like? You know, these are things I go over because the sales are great. But if you don't have all these other pieces, it's a short-term sales cycle. You're not going to get the repeat customers. So I think, you know, kind of add to it, I think typically, you know, the sales sometimes can get a negative connotation because it is money driven. But I think a lot of then it comes down to like, who is the person you're working with? You know, are they just in it to make a sale and that's it? And then you know, like say like a mortgage broker, you know, they're doing a refinance. They just make their money, do a refinance, you never hear from again. Or are they going to work with you when 
hey, by the way, rates are low, or now's a good time to do, you know, a HELOC loan, or, you know, give you different, you know, hey, here's an insurance company you should work with, they've got great rates, right? They, they bring more value than just the initial sale. And I think those are the companies that truly excel. Okay. So, okay, a little bit more personal about you. If there was a book to be written about you, Dan, what would the title be? It's a good one. I wrote down three different titles. Because I, I know we, we had talked about this and I, you, you kind of said, you know, think about it. Um, honestly, I, there's a great book out there called, um, I think it's like Subtle Art and Not Giving an F, right? And it's a great book. And I think for me, it would be something similar would be like Two Shits Given, right? Still kind of politically correct, but also gets the point across. And it's a book that would go, what is this, right? It catches your eye. Same thing in marketing. You want something that catches your eye, that doesn't like upset a customer, kind of you know sparks them and makes them want to read it. And I think for me that would work because I think in life you have to learn that there's more than just working, and that's the reason I do what I do now. Because there's so much more to life, to traveling and and doing things, doing your hobbies. You know, kind of like, like when you were a kid, what, what what did you want to do? Like I want to be a firefighter, or I wanted to go into space, or I wanted to be a pilot. Like how come you never did that? You know, well I don't know. I went down this path, right? And I think for me, lately, especially with you know us being quarantined, I've, I've been reading a bunch of different books. And that was one I read recently that I'm like, this is definitely more of my mindset of kind of like, don't stress the small stuff, basically, right? Like you work hard, at, you know, you've got your own business as well. It's so easy to get caught up in a bubble of stress that work, 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 got to make this money, I provide for the family, versus just kind of saying screw it sometimes. And who cares that customer doesn't sign up, you know? Then if you go into it with a different mindset of, I don't care that they don't sign up, not that you don't want them to, but you don't need them, right? There's a big difference how you come across in a call or how, how you come across to the customers of caring more about them and you still want their business, but you're not desperate for it. And I think if you got to have like that more, yeah, like I said, I, the book I said was two shits given, you know, it will be the most politically correct, but I think it would make someone pick up the book and want to read it and they'd go, yeah, sometimes I do overthink things. Sometimes I, I overanalyze things. And sometimes you just kind of have to just put it on paper and vomit on paper and say, this is what it is. And that's what we're going to do. Let's move forward and see how it works. Because there's a lot of times in business where you spend too much time on something, trying to build something out or think about it or build it. And you don't get anywhere because you spent six months trying to build it. Right. And I think for me, I kind of, you know, it's, that's the title that I thought would be of more about me, I guess, the personality will be sometimes you kind of just say, yeah, screw it. You know, who cares? You know, it's like, did you win the lotto? No, you kind of were, you know, <laughs> it is what it is. Right. Um, so I kind of think that would be, would be mine. I've, I've kind of learned over time that you push yourself too hard and then you kind of like a breaking point and then you just kind of get too stressed up. And I think, you know, I think I'm at a point now, I'm like, hey, I love growing my company and I love working with new companies and helping them grow. But then there's times where like that person didn't want to move forward or they maybe didn't think it was a good fit. That's okay. Like they're going to find what, what you know, what meets their needs. Right. Right. So Dan, um, just got a couple of minutes left. Sure. What would be the best compliment you've ever received? Um, so I have a sales rep that I had trained early in my career when I was starting off in the mortgage industry and, you know, worked up to, the cor corporate trainer basically traveled around the US and I went all over, you know, Nashville, Memphis, Miami, Dallas, I mean, you name it, all the major cities I sat there and basically was sent there to open up new offices. And I was sent to Memphis, I'd never been to before, and we had office in uh, Nashville and Memphis and we'd hop back and forth between the two new offices. And I had this younger kid who basically reminded me of myself. I mean, he was probably six, seven years younger, but I probably was a kid now, but Really, he was early in his career, just like I was. And he was just as driven, if not more, than I was when I started. But he was willing to be a sponge, and he was willing to learn like I was able to do. And I really invested in him. And I ran into him, and he, he, he did very well, and I, I trained him. We kept in contact, even though I was in Sacramento at that office. We still had kept in contact a little bit here and there. Then we both kind of moved on with our careers, and I didn't hear, hear from him. For, for, you know, probably seven, eight years. And I ran into him at a trade show, a random trade show for internet and in Vegas. And I hear this name, Danimal, which was a nickname. 
I still, I still get it, Danimal. And he's like, Danimal. And I'm like, thinking this is like college days, maybe like my old fraternity days or something. Maybe training, I don't know if I should say hi to this guy. And he comes run up, gives me a big hug. And I didn't recognize it at first. And he's like, hey, it's Paul. And I'm like, I, I'm sorry, like, I, I don't remember you. Like, I, I, I see some people at this convention we got going on. I'm sorry, I don't remember you. And he's like, no, I was like, we work together at, you know, this mortgage company. I'm like, holy shit, like, we actually, we work together. And he's like, I, he's like, I want to thank you so much for, like, pushing me out of my comfort zone. Because you, we would sit down once a week uh, for, like, the first three months. And we, when I first was with, with that office. And we would go over the things he needed to work on. He would do every single one of them. But then we always would find something else that I think he would need to do better. Even if he, I didn't think he needed to do it, I learned from one of my managers to find one extra thing to push your employees further than they think they can, they can be at or even that you think they can be at, right, at their level. And I always did that. And I kind of learned that and you know, take it to other companies. And we would always find something that we were always pushing each other to do um, better. And I did something where it would, the, the sales reps would do the same thing for the managers. So vice versa, not just what the managers think you should do, we would flip the coin and what do you think your manager should do better? Managers typically are, I, I know it all, right? It's not true. <laughs> a lot of times we do things or say things a certain way and it doesn't come across the right way. So maybe that's something you have to work on. Something I've had to work on in my career. And that was one thing that I did and we basically would push each other. And he was so thankful that we, were, we I pushed him to be where he was at. And I actually advised him to leave the company, to go to another company because he'd already hit his level. He couldn't go any further. Um, and he eventually made himself up to a sales manager and he's running a sales team. And that's the reason he was there at that event because he was with a new company. And he was like so excited that, you know, we had worked together and I really kind of pushed him out of his comfort zone. And there was time he said, it was his, his wife now, at that time they were dating. He's like, and he'd go home. He's like, oh, this manager, like he's just, he's like, he's always finding something for me to work on. You know, he's like, he'll give me praise. We work together, but there's always one thing that he's like, I want you to work on this and make this better for next week or for the next two weeks. And he's like, it was kind of like military, even though I've never been in the military. He said it kind of reminded him a little bit of like always try to strive to be better. Right. Um, and so I got to meet his team and it was, it was, it was, it was a really cool kind of, for me, like a cool event and a, a good story to kind of like, and, and a follow up with somebody that I worked with earlier in my career and now see them being successful and that you could have, you know, an effect on somebody, you know, that you've worked with. For me, that, that I really enjoy that. And that's kind of one of the reasons I want to do what I do now instead of working for one company because I can only affect one company, right? Versus I can work with 10 companies. I, I don't work with a large number of companies. I would typically work with 10 companies max. I, I like to work with five to eight um, at a time. And then that way I still have enough time to you know, provide like the services and the trainings that, that need to be done. Um, you know, so I think for me, that was probably one of the most ones, the best compliment I've ever received was the training and, and the mentoring I put into this person, they were able to take that training and take it to the rest of their career. That's that's really great, Dan. And that really falls in line with what I do. And, and that's really tapping into potential that has not been tapped into. And that's what I hear you say. And that's a perfect example of when people care about someone else as an individual. Um, yeah. And you mentioned it earlier, the sales, you know, your typical um, uh, misunderstanding, if you will, is, Sales is about money, money, money. And yeah. while that's good, we can't forget about the people that are around us as well, including yeah. the customers and the people we're working with. So um, I really like that you do that, Dan. Um, just last couple seconds, um, how can we find you? Uh, Facebook website, phone number, that type of stuff. Yeah, Facebook I mostly use for personal stuff. I'm, I'm, I use social media a lot in business for companies I work with, but the find me is be on LinkedIn, okay. uh, through Dan Alcorn, or you go to my website, which will take you to a very simple questionnaire. It's what I use for all of my new new companies that, that want to work with me. Um, it'll just be DanielAllcorn.com. It is Daniel, my first name, last name, A-L-L-C-O-R-N, all and then corn, one word, dot com. And that'll basically take you to a questionnaire. Again, some very simple questions about your business size and your team, what you want to focus on. And then it takes you to my calendar link, book a call, uh, 15 minutes, and we'll see if it's a good fit. And we'll kind of go from there. Love it. Seamless. Uh, it's the way that our business should be. Thank you so much, Dan, for being on this podcast. I appreciate, I appreciate your energy, your expertise, your wisdom, 
and um, what you're doing for um, the companies that you serve. Thank you so much. Thanks for having me on. I really appreciate it. Not a problem. Well, thanks for listening to Epic, another podcast episode from With Purpose. Again, my name is Chris Aird, and I am the owner as well as lead business strategist. I hope you have a great day. And um, as I always say, um, live, work, and think through your life with purpose. Thank you.